everybody. Happy to see you again today. Uh, let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, once again we come studying your word and asking that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive your fresh. Father, we realize that if you don't give the increase, then nothing will happen. We thank you, Father, in advance. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So we are, of course, still on article number 12, the harmony of the law and the gospel. Our author writes, we believe that the law of God is the eternal and unchangeable rule of his moral government, that it is holy, just, and good, and that the inability which the scripture ascribes to fallen men to fulfill its precepts arises entirely from their love of sin to deliver them from which and to restore them through a mediator to unfeigned obedience to the holy law is one great end of the gospel and of the means of grace connected with the establishment of the visible church. So our scripture today is coming from uh, Romans, the 10th chapter, and also from Matthew, the 5th chapter, verses 17 through 18. So that's Romans, the 10th chapter, verse 4, and both will be from the New King James Version. Romans 10th chapter, chapter, 10th chapter, verse 4, which reads, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And then Matthew 5, verse 17 through 19, says, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So when you read the two, it sounds like a contradiction. Paul says he is, and Jesus says he's not. For however long we've been on Article 12, the harmony of the law and the gospel, I have felt that I've been kind of walking on a tightrope trying to be ever so careful not to misinterpret the importance of the law. Paul wrote, For Christ is the end of the law, for righteousness to everyone who believes. And Jesus said that he had not come to do, do away with the law or the prophets, but to fulfill. And, and then as if to put a stamp on it, Jesus also said, For assuredly, uh, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. So Paul says he's the end of the law. And Jesus says, no, I, I, I'm not doing away with the law. So the question is, what is the law? Are, are, are we talking about something different? In the Bible, the law is referred to as the Ten Commandments and the law is referred to as the law of Moses and the law is referred to as man's law. So we must be careful not to confuse the three. The law of Moses was written by the hand of Moses. The law of God or the commandments of God are the Ten Commandments, and they were written by the finger of God. And of course, man's laws are just that, those that man came up with, which we won't even discuss. But Exodus 31, verse 18, again, the New King James Version says, And when he, meaning God, had made an end of speaking with him, meaning Moses, on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. So we see here that the, the law or the Ten Commandments is called the tablets of testimony. 
And then Exodus 32 and 16 says that the tablet tables were the work of God and the writing was the writing of God graven upon the tables. So the Ten Commandments, they were written in stone with the finger of God. That in itself sends a strong message that they were permanent. Even in our day and time, you know, when we say that something is written in stone, that is usually symbolically saying that it is permanent and cannot be changed. Ecclesiastes 3 and 14 says, and again, the New King James Version says, knowing that whatever God does, it shall be forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it that men should fear before him. So another distinction between the law of God and the law of Moses is the their placement in the ark. Exodus 25 and 16, and, and I should forewarn you, there's probably going to be a lot of scripture. Exodus 25 and 16 tells us that God instructed Moses to put the table tablets in, in the ark. In, in fact, if you continue reading the verses below uh, verse 16, you will see that God instructed that the testimony or the tablets should be placed under the mercy seat. And the mercy seat is symbolic of Jesus Christ. And, and, and God said that, you know, that when God spoke to Moses, he would speak to him from above the mercy seat. That means that between God and the law of God, is the mercy seat or Jesus Christ acting on our behalf. So you got God, then the mercy seat, then the law of God. So the law of God written by the finger of God on the table of stones is placed in the ark under the mercy seat. But the law of Moses, which was written by the hand of Moses, was placed in the side of the ark. Deuteronomy 31, verse 24 and 20 through 27, and this is the NIV, it says, after Moses finished writing in a book the words of this law from beginning to end, he gave this command to the Levites who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. Take this book of the law and place it beside the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God. There it will remain as a witness against you. So remember when Moses went up to the mountain and, and God gave him, you know, all the, uh, the rituals and, the, and the, the sacrifices and all the different days, he told Moses to write this in a book, okay? And so Moses wrote that in a book and they put that on the side of the ark, not inside the ark, but on the side of the ark. So the law of Moses was placed in the side of the ark, which shows that it is separate from the commandments. The law of Moses was written by the hand of Moses, not the finger of God. Then also to show the importance of the law of God written by the finger of God on the table, table of stone. It's like when Moses came down the mountain with the first set of, uh, and saw that the people were worshiping the golden calf, he threw the tables of stone and broke them. But in Exodus 34, God wrote them again uh, on tables of stone that Moses had to hew out, had to cut out of the mountain. So I'd say that that shows the importance of the law of God or the Ten Commandments, and it shows the permanency of them. So we cannot say that, hey, I don't have to obey the Ten Commandments. And, and then another distinction uh, or to show the importance is that in, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount tells us in Matthew 5, 17 through 20, he says, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For surely I say to you, to heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so 
shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So, and then Jesus also in the Sermon on the Mount goes through some of the Ten Commandments. So the, the, the rituals and all that part of the law has to be fulfilled. And then Jesus goes through the Ten Commandments, which tells us that they are not done away with. He actually strengthens them by going not just uh, not just like an outer thing, but Jesus goes to the heart of the commands. He says that we are not to break the commandments, nor are we to teach others to break them. Then when one of the experts of the law tried to trip him up, you know, like they were known to do, uh, by asking Jesus which of the commandments were the greatest, Jesus summed up the 10 into two. And, and he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And then the second being to love your neighbor as yourself. So clearly the 10 commandments are not done away with. Jesus kept the Ten Commandments and he taught the Ten Commandments and, 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 and he taught not only the Ten Commandments, but he included grace in there. So one such time when, when he taught the Ten Commandments uh, or taught the commandments and then he also included grace was when the woman was caught in the act of adultery and was dragged before him while he was teaching in the temple court. They forced her to stand before all the people and tried to trip up Jesus. Now, you know, most folks would be like, so where's the man? That's a whole different lesson. So we're not going to talk about that. But they forced her to stand before all these folks and, 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 and try to trip Jesus up. They wanted to know what he would do about her since the interpretation of the law was that she should be stoned. Of course, Jesus knew that they were what they were up to. So he just stooped and wrote on the ground with his finger. And, you know, of course, everybody want to know what he wrote. But obviously, it's not important because it's not in the Bible, because we would focus on that as opposed to the point that he was making. So when they persisted, Jesus stood up and said, let any of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone. And then he stooped back down and, and started writing again on the ground. Then one by one, the Bible says, from the oldest to the youngest, they slipped away until only Jesus and the woman was left. And, and when they all left, then Jesus dealt with the woman. He, he asked her, first of all, where was her accusers? And they were all gone. There was no one left to accuse her. And so Jesus, in essence, by saying, telling them the, the one who is without uh, sin, cast the first stone, he exposed the sin in all of them. And he does that to us. When we try to accuse someone else, when we are guilty, we, see, we have seen that play out so many times uh, in the news media when somebody is, is, is just going after somebody else for some sin that they've done. And then later on, we find out that they were just as guilty. So her accusers became acutely aware of their own sin. I would imagine that one by one, they lowered their heads and, and kind of quietly tipped away, uh, knowing that they too deserve to be stoned. In, in my mind, uh, since they didn't bring the man also, I'd like to think that he was part of that crowd that walked away. The, the people who had come to trap Jesus had left in shame. And, and Jesus showed this woman, he showed her grace, he showed her mercy, and he showed her forgiveness. And he did not show her condemnation. He told her to go and leave her life of sin. When, when Jesus forgave the woman, he did not excuse her sin or treat it lightly. He expected a change of heart 
and, and a repentance. Uh, instead of condemnation, he presented her with an opportunity to begin a new life. And that's what he does for all of us. When Jesus comes into our messed up lives, our messed up worlds, he presents us with an opportunity to begin anew. Jesus silenced his critics and demonstrated grace and mercy and forgiveness. He didn't condemn the woman but he didn't overlook her sin. He told her to go and leave her life of sin. He, he called her to a new and transformed life. He, in essence, told her to go and behave yourself. Cut it out. Stop it. He, he wasn't telling her to behave according to uh, what was normal for that day, nor was he telling her to behave by what felt right to her. You know how we do. We, we, if it feels right to me, then it must be right, right? That, that would not have been the solution to her problem, nor is it the solution to our problem. Doing what feels good to me is not the solution to my sin problem. She had a sin problem. We have a sin problem. And, and sin is an action or thought that is contrary to the law of God. It is not contrary to some human standard. It, it, she's not to uh, uh, like hold her sin up to human standards and, and then decide, oh, it's okay. Because think about it. If we were only trying to live up to human standards, then the field would be wide open, especially in today's time when nothing is absolute, not even not even uh, a simple thing like what is male and what is female. That used to be something that we could all agree on. Now, even that is controversial. Jesus told her to live from, the, from then on by the Ten Commandments, by the commandments of God. He clearly states that you should not commit adultery. And Jesus' teachings makes it even clear that he takes it to heart. Clearly, Jesus is not doing away with the law. So we're back to the question. What did Paul mean when he said that Christ is the end of the law? Join us next time as we continue our study in the law, in, in the harmony of the law and the gospel. And until then, be safe, take care. See you next time. Bye-bye.